Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Fidelis. I'm Cassie and Laura here today. How has your week been going? Uh, it's been a rough few weeks, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been really rough. There's just a lot of things going on. We're trying to move um, health conditions, landlord situation. Um, so, yeah, but it'll pass. How about you? Well, we're hanging in there. Um, we're actually starting to have to kind of juggle some things that are a little bit relevant to our discussion topic today. Um, it's that our son, um, Wyatt, that has Down syndrome, he's probably going to have to change schools. Yeah. And um, there are also some friends of mine who have, and this is kind of what inspired me to want to talk about this, is that I have a couple of friends whose children also have Down syndrome, and they are facing discrimination in their schools. Mm. Um, and so I wanted to talk about that today and how that is something that is a problem even in the Catholic Church. Um, in their cases, in my friends' cases, um, both of their, well, at least one of them, I know one of their schools is a Christian school. I don't believe it's a Catholic school, but it's a Christian school. Mm -hmm. In Wyatt's case, we're in a public school, public school system, but that's because there is not a single school in our entire diocese that will take a child with a disability. And that was really frustrating when we first moved here. And then I started doing some research and I found that across the entire country, this is a widespread issue. This isn't just my diocese happens to be not accepting of children with disabilities. This is something that it goes on everywhere. And the schools that do accept children with disabilities, those are the exceptions to the rule. Okay. And so I wanted to kind of talk about that because part of being pro-life is advocating for people with disabilities. It's all about respecting life from you know, cradle to grave. And mm -hmm. even if those lives are, you know, maybe not what we expect them to be or think they should be. Um, so I wanted to see if this is something that maybe you had any kind of experience with because you have a son with epilepsy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he yeah. was diagnosed, diagnosed when he was two years old. He was almost three. Um, but the child care and school situation that he's in, the people that are taking care of him now already knew him before he was diagnosed. So I think if there would have been an issue with discrimination, you haven't had to deal with it because everyone already knows him. You know what I mean? So he was kind of already a human to them. Yeah. Well, we've been pretty lucky. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, I feel always a little bit strange about this. Like, Wyatt has Down syndrome, so he's really my special needs child. But Benjamin and Ivy, two of my other children, they also are technically considered developmentally delayed. Mm -hmm. um, and so they are in the ESD program. Um, they both have problems with speech and language, and then also like processing. It, it's harder for them to understand things. Um, and even then, at seven, it's like you can see him like kind of struggle to think almost. You know, like he'll sit there and He's kind of cute the way he'll sit there and go like this, you know, <laughs> he's thinking. Yeah. But so they have to be, you know, they have IEPs in there and their special programs. And we're actually really lucky that the Catholic school that Ben goes to is extremely accepting of kids with disabilities as much as they can be. Um, we have a student there that has epilepsy. Um, I, I'm not 100% certain but I believe that there are children that might have autism there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Ben goes and they work with him so much. Um, they give him whatever allowances that he needs. The principal herself has, has assured me, you know, we just want to support him and do whatever we can to, you know, make sure that he's successful. Um, I believe there's at least one student in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. But more serious learning disabilities are not possible for that school yet. Now, her attitude is one where she's, you know, her goal is to accept children with more serious disabilities like Down syndrome. So, and I'm saying that because I'm not trying to come in here and be like, oh, you know, Catholic education is terrible. Yeah. I'm not trying to like rag on, you know, the Catholic school system or the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. But I think to ignore that this is an issue that affects our world, and that includes the church, is a little bit... Um, dishonest because it is a problem and the only way that we can kind of address it is to talk about it um 
like a school that we went to <laughs> that we considered sending our kids to a Catholic school. Um, the principal actually not only said that she wouldn't accept a child with a disability like Down syndrome, that even if they needed no help, she still wouldn't do it. Even if she could, that was what her words. Yeah. Even if I could take a child with Down syndrome, I wouldn't. Because if you take one, you have to take them all. Those were her words. I hate that was, attitude. And I just, yeah. And I, I remember when that happened, I was so angry and offended because it's like, this is part of being pro-life. Mm -hmm. You can't sit there and tell women, you know, oh, well, if you get a prenatal diagnosis of a disability, you need to keep the baby. But, oh, by the way, we're not going to support you. Mm -hmm. And that's an important issue because you and I, we both work in the pro-life movement. Mm -hmm. And the ableism and eugenics that happens with abortion today is insane. Yeah, it, it's really it's sad to see that attitude seeping into some Catholic um, cultures. I don't know why I'm doing it because I have earbuds on. Uh, so sorry. But yeah, it's really sad to hear that, that you had that experience because um, we've seen like some crazy stuff lately. We've seen a Washington Post op-ed. Uh, I can't remember the author's name. Do you remember her name? Marcus. Yes. Oh my gosh. So <laughs> the Washington, Washington Post proudly posted on their opinion um, page that this woman's opinion, her name is Ruth Marcus. She's a, a regular contributor to WAPO's um, opinion page. And she said that if she ever had a child who was diagnosed with Down syndrome, she would abort the child. And the argument is totally nonsensical. The only way to explain the worldview that she's coming from is eugenics. And eugenics is the belief that developed after the theory of evolution um, kind of came into existence that, um, the the world should be a race should be made out of a race of thoroughbreds and thoroughbreds are typically defined as white people who don't have any sort of disability um, don't have any mental handicap physical ha handicap illness disease cancer um, crim they're not they don't have a criminal background their parents don't have a criminal background um, they don't come from poverty so eugenicists in the, the early 19th century and um, much of the 18th, or ni excuse me, the early 1900s and much of the 1800s, they were seeking to kind of wipe out uh, the populations that they viewed to be unfit. And that included a whole lot of categories of people that included people like your son, Wyatt, who has Down syndrome because they would have viewed him as flawed and not worthy of human rights. And so that mindset really, um, really had a strong impact on the culture. And it's been really, it's been a slow process, I think, throughout history, modern history, to kind of get rid of that mindset and to view all people as equal. Of course, we still don't because we still have um, the entire class of preborn children be being viewed by a lot of people as not deserving of human life, but also abortions that are being committed because children are diagnosed in utero with conditions that their parents don't want to deal with. And so abortions aren't just being used because the preborn aren't viewed as human, but they're also being used by people who would otherwise welcome a child into the world. They're being used to eradicate certain populations. And you're seeing this be a pervasive trend in certain uh, countries. Of course, in the US, um, it's thought that most children who are diagnosed with Down syndrome in utero are probably aborted. Um, but then in countries like Iceland, there are no more births of Down syndrome, syndrome children at all. And that's not because people have stopped conceiving them. It's because the genetic counselors in Iceland under the socialist healthcare system there um, encourage people to abort anybody who is diagnosed with Down syndrome in utero. So they're, um, they're at a 100% search and destroy rate in Iceland um, of children with Down syndrome. To think that that mindset might be present in some parts of the Catholic Church is horrifying. So it's it's really disturbing to hear that you had that experience. Um, I hope it's not widespread. I haven't had it with my son with epilepsy, but again, um, everyone everyone that he knows now in the schools and daycares and childcare situations that he's in, he knew before the diagnosis. So I don't really know how they would have reacted if he had been, if we'd been a new family and we brought them someone who was already diagnosed with epilepsy. Yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to single out 
Catholic institutions in the sense that this is a uniquely Catholic problem. It's not. Um, among Down syndrome moms that I know, um, this, this happens across every sphere um, where we have to fight for our kids just to get them a decent education. Mm -hmm. um, just for them to get the allowances that other kids just kind of get taken for granted. Um, I see some moms where it's like, you know, one recently listed like the complaints that her that were sent home with her son. And I was just reading it thinking, this is the most petty BS. I can't, like, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at it and understand like why they're doing that. Mm -hmm especially when you have a mom that's a bit of a mama bear and is, you know, really pushing and fighting for her son. Mm -hmm. or I can't remember if it, who, who it was specifically, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's really fighting for their child. So it's like they're already kind of a thorn in their side and well, this is how the administration is retaliating. Mm -hmm. But the point in me saying that is that this happens everywhere, that the Catholic Church is supposed to be better than this mm -hmm. and we should be demanding better. Mm -hmm. It's also something that's not just, you know, an, an education issue. Um, when you look at a lot of the complaints, for example, about <laughs> the parents, like you have their kids at mass, and when he's got kids, I'm sure you've heard that before. People complain, you know, about how parents, well, why are you just sitting there with your breath screaming at church? Mm -hmm. you know, like, why don't you do something about it? And it's like, well, you know, you don't know that that kid is just being a brat. You know, like for all you know, so many disabilities are invisible mm -hmm. and you can't see them. And just because that kid looks normal doesn't mean that there isn't something going on that you don't know about. And it's so much harder to work to make a world that is friendly for people with disabilities. So, I mean, the easy thing to do is just sit there and say, oh, when I was that age, you know, I didn't get to get away with those things or no, you can't send your kid with a disability here because that would be hard. Doing right. the other thing is just what people want to do. And, and it's frustrating, but the church should be better than that. And in a lot of ways it is, you know, Pope Francis is very, um, has done a lot for people with disabilities. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that I've really liked about him, but there always can be more that can be done and needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, education is a pretty big part of that. Yeah, and we got it. We have to change the culture to view disability um, differently and to treat people with disabilities differently because I I feel like it's a vicious cycle. Um, people who people see the way that others with disabilities are treated and not accommodated, and then they become pregnant with a child with disabilities and they don't see the hope that they should have. Um, with that diagnosis, they might only see what the culture has shown them, which in many cases is discrimination and a eugenics attitude. Um, and it, I don't know, what are, as the mom of, of a child with Down syndrome, I mean, what are some actionable things that you think that we could do to, to make that a little bit better, to make the world a little bit better in that regard? Well, so much of the issue, especially regarding education, has to do with um, I mean, politics. Mm -hmm. A big part of the reason that so many private schools, because this isn't a uniquely Catholic school problem, all private schools, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. So, again, I'm I just want to stress, like, I'm not trying to attack, you know, Catholic right. institutions. Right. This isn't a Catholic problem. It's more mm -hmm. to me that, you know, I'm a little bit more offended when I see it happening in Catholic schools or Catholic parishes because it's like we're supposed to be better but this is not a Catholic problem this is an mm -hmm. everywhere problem mm -hmm. but in any case um, public schools every public school is um, required to accept people with disabilities you are not allowed to discriminate based on disability mm -hmm. um, they certainly try don't get me wrong <laughs> 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 um, it's illegal and they get federal funding specifically for that private mm -hmm. schools on the other hand do not so mm -hmm. that is why you do not see as many services in private schools as you do in public schools because they don't get the funding for that and that is one thing that i understand um it's, it's very difficult for a private school to figure out a way where they can give children with disabilities that need more support and need more resources the things that they need to help them be successful I get that. But there are schools that do it. 
it's not impossible. It's just hard work. And that's what it comes down to is that I think for a lot of people, especially older people, um, they just don't see people with disabilities as worth it. Because I'm sure, like this one school that, that said, even if I could take children with Down syndrome, I wouldn't. You know, they have a reputation for being one of the best schools in the diocese. They have, like, the best grades, the best academics. And I can only imagine that that's got to play a role. Because, mm-hmm. oh, if we start taking children that have autism or Down syndrome or other intellectual disabilities, is their academic, you know, reputation going to be harmed? Mm. Well, all of a sudden now we won't have the best grades in the diocese anymore, you know, and that's just speculation, but it would be foolish to assume that that doesn't play a role in some level because there's got to be the thought that, you know, well, for someone that has a serious intellectual disability, why should we put all of this time and work and money into a student that it's really not going to pay off? Yeah. Isn't someone who's going to go to Yale, you think? Mm Mm-hmm one that's going to graduate from college and go start a business or become a president. Mm -hmm. You think this is just someone that, you know, they're going to live at home forever and they're not going to have a real career. So what's the point in putting all this effort in? I I really do think that, especially in some of the older generations, the ones that are kind of more in charge right now, I really think that that's a large part of the mindset that they have, that it's just not worth the effort Mm -hmm. because they're not as important. They're not going to do as much. So it sounds like private school administrators um, hiring uh, is probably hiring the correct person is probably a challenge because you want somebody in a Catholic private school that's not only like aligned on theology and thinks that academics are important, but also has that Catholic um, worldview when it comes to pro-life values and human rights. Uh, so it's not, it's like a tall order, but those people are out there. I guess it sounds like part of the the issue is just identifying the correct candidate when you're interviewing principals and that kind of thing. The principal of our school that Ben goes to is exactly mm-hmm. like this. When we first toured the school, she did not know about Wyatt at all. Um, mm-hmm. I had told her anything about our family. So we're touring the school and she's showing us around and she was telling me what the long-term goals for the school was. And she said, right now we're working on our building funds. We can build an auditorium and cafeteria. She said, now after that's finished, my next goal is to hire more resource teachers so that we can start accepting kids with disabilities like Down syndrome and autism. Mm-hmm. And I, I almost literally started crying, like right yeah. there in the classroom, because it was just, my feeling was, this may never come to fruition for Wyatt, but I don't want to send my kids to a school where the people there think that his brother is inferior and right. is not worthy of going to the school. Mm-hmm. And you know, you can try to advocate for more resource teachers and things of that nature, because even if you can't necessarily accept a child with Down syndrome, that can still help people like Benjamin or just with the overall, you know, mentality and point of view with these schools, you know, a kid that even has diabetes, a kid with type 1 diabetes, that can be more of, I don't want to say an issue, that's the wrong word, but I mean, it's it's more difficult it more to mm-hmm. have any health issues because they've got to monitor their blood sugar. They mm-hmm. can potentially get insulin shots during the school day. And you have to have a staff that is going to be okay with that, mm-hmm. that is going to be okay with letting you know this child potentially get up in the middle of a lesson and go and check his blood sugar, go to the office and you know get insulin or get snacks more often because their blood sugar can't get too low either. Mm-hmm. Right. Even like that, that may seem small to us. You know, I understand that it's a lot of logistical juggling, mm-hmm. but you have to have the drive to want to do it. And the problem is, is that this isn't just a, well, this is other people's families. This, it's like you said, this affects the mentality. If we, if we continue with this mentality where people with disabilities should go somewhere else and they shouldn't be going to our schools and they're too much of a pain, they're a burden. Mm-hmm. They're not as good. They're inferior. That's what leads people to seek out abortion when they get yeah. positive diagnosis. Exactly. Yeah, and that's probably happening among Catholic women at about the same rate as it is among the women in the mainstream culture. 
um, the abortion rate in general is the same within among like church going Catholic women as it is among the mainstream culture. So I wouldn't imagine that that's different when it comes to children with disabilities. I mean, you're, I, I would love to get numbers on that, but I imagine that you're right because I mean, it stands to reason. And that's sad because it's what that says to me is that we're failing these women. Yeah, exactly. Not even just with disability specific, but just abortion at all. The fact that Catholic women are getting abortions the same rate as the general population, we're failing these women. Mm -hmm. And the other big issue that's that's pro life with disabilities right now is um, euthanasia and assisted suicide, which is spreading like wildfire. Mm -hmm. Um, Hawaii just became the latest state to legalize it. And this is another issue that people think, oh, well, it's just for the terminally ill, and that's a whole other, you know, that's a whole other can of worms. We can talk about that another time. Mm-hmm. But one, no, it's not just for the terminally ill. That That is never how it happens. Mm-hmm. And you can look at various other countries that have had assisted suicide legal for a long time, and the people that are most um, likely to use it are the people who are the most vulnerable. So people right. who are poor, people who don't have a lot of support, people who are mentally ill are able to be euthanized in countries like Belgium and the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. Canada is now considering it too. Yeah. Um, people with disabilities. There were twins in Belgium. It's either Belgium or the Netherlands, one or the other. The twins that euthanized themselves because they were, they were deaf and they were going blind or they were, they were blind and deaf. Mm-hmm. But because they had these disabilities, they chose to kill themselves. Mm-hmm. And these are the things that we set people up for. Mm-hmm. And there have been multiple, multiple studies done in legitimate medical journals, like the New England Journal of Medicine and the British mm-hmm. Medical Journal. So these are prestigious medical journals. Right. And basically what they found was people who seek out assisted suicide tend to be people who are depressed or hopeless Um they are scared of being a burden on their families. Mm-hmm. They are scared of um, not having support. So mm-hmm. when you look at it through that lens, these are the things that people that get assisted suicide are worried about. They're not worried about the pain of their disease. Right. This has been found multiple times. They're not worried about the disease so much. They're worried they're going to be a burden on the people around them. Yeah. They feel they have no hope. And when you see that people with disabilities are being euthanized, You know, it makes perfect sense that this is something to be very worried about because Mm -hmm. imagine you were an adult and you have a serious disability and you're starting to get older and the cost of your care is growing. You Mm -hmm. know, and and well, if I just pay a couple hundred dollars, I can end it all and I won't be a burden on my family anymore. Only despair would lead you to um, that decision, I think. Only despair and, and hopelessness whether it's despair in the face of being a burden on other people, despair at the costs that you're going to rack up. And a lot, in a lot of cases, it's, it's not despair as a result of other issues. It's depression itself that is starting to lead people to utilize assisted suicide now um, because we introduced euthanasia in the West as the solution to suffering And so, of course, now people that are in mental anguish are going to view euthanasia as a way to find relief. Um, That that's horrifying on a societal level that that we would instead of treating someone and reaffirming their human dignity and their value, um, the medical community and the legal community would say, "Okay, you can go ahead and kill yourself. That's not a service to the individual who's suffering, and it's certainly not a service to the culture at large, because it just every time a person utilizes assisted suicide, it reaffirms to the people around them that a a lower um, human dignity that is represented in their culture. Um, We break down, we break down human dignity, which is already suffering with the abortion culture. Now we have to also go and deal with the euthanasia and assisted suicide culture. And I want to say from a PR standpoint, because I do PR, um, the organization that's really pushing for this in the United States is um, 
Compassion and Choices, that is their current name, but they changed their name. Their name was the Hemlock Society. So this is an organization, the Hemlock Society. Uh, I think it was started by Kevorkian, um, who would go around helping people kill themselves when it was not legal. Um, this organization, it, it's diabolical. Um, and they basically glorify death. Um, it really is diabolical. I mean, you can draw so many parallels between the Hemlock Society and the culture of death. But um, in a few years ago, I'm sure that you remember the Brittany Maynard story. It, um, she was a California resident. And before, I think assisted suicide was since legalized in California. But be before it was, um, she moved to Oregon. Was it Oregon or Washington? Oregon, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Um, she moved to Oregon because she wanted, she developed stage four, a stage four like glioblastoma in her brain. She was given um, a certain amount of time to live um, and she felt that her quality of life was deteriorating. Um, and her whole story is really bizarre the way that it was presented to the media, but Compassion and Choices basically globbed onto her and decided to make her their PR representative. And they used her story they put her on the cover of People Magazine. And when I say they used her, I mean they used her. Um, she was not going to People Magazine of her own accord and saying, I want to tell my story to America. Compassion and Choices found her in her desperate state of being suicidal. This is not a person that's in a place to make PR decisions about her life. Um, and they used her story. They turned it into this huge sob story about how she didn't have the right to access assisted suicide in the state of California and how that was such an injustice and how the language they used. It's very interesting. The compassion and choices language completely aligns with the language that was used to legalize abortion. So they said it's her body. It's her choice to do what she wants with her body. Um, and they created this rhetoric that people had come to accept with abortion. And so it was very hard to counteract that rhetoric when it came to a different type of death. And so she did end up taking a lethal dose, dose of barbiturates on, I think it was like November 1st, 2000, I don't know, what was it, 2015, 2014? It was a few years ago. Birthday, I remember that. Yeah. Because we were thinking, you know, she's like, I want one more birthday with my husband. Yeah. Like, and every year, you will remember. <laughs> exactly. It, it was just such a sad story. Um, but I always want to like point out to people that that was not Brittany Maynard trying to create this big justice movement for suffering people. That was a, a death organization called the Hemlock Society that was using her for a PR campaign. And it was so successful that they ultimately did legalize abortion in California. And her story has been used as kind of like the poster child for now there's been six states that have legalized uh, assisted suicide with uh, Hawaii being the latest, like you just said. So we have a lot of work to do to counteract this rhetoric. And now it's coming at us now from both sides, because on the one end, you have less end suffering and disabilities through abortion before the child is even born. And on the other hand, you have, well, if you weren't aborted, then we can just kill you anyway later in your life. And in some countries, it's gotten to the point that in Belgium, I think, children can be euthanized. And I don't mean assisted suicide because children are not capable of consent. Um, children can be injected with barbiturates and killed if their parents don't want them to live because they view them as suffering or who knows what else. Um, well, but the, the, child the, has to request these, the child has to request the euthanasia. But the problem with that is that if you have, say, in theory, I don't know, a 10 year old, right. where are they getting this idea from? Exactly. You know, it mm -hmm. just, it's, it's my, and the thing about Brittany Maynard that's really relevant here is that you may live your whole life being perfectly able-bodied, but that doesn't mean that one day that's not going to change. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it changed for Brittany Maynard. Exactly. And In an instant. Part of the, the problem with that, well, I mean, just with assisted suicide in general, but just with Brittany Maynard, one thing that was really, I thought, suspicious and there's nothing that's ever gonna not saying that she was like murdered but just she a couple of days before the day mm -hmm. that she said she was gonna die yep put out publicly right. that she changed her mind right she had said you know i don't feel like now is the time anymore yeah i remember that 
she said she wasn't going to do it. And I was then, shocked on November 1st when they reported that she had, because I was like, what? She had, I thought she changed her mind. And it, it makes you wonder, did she fall into like some horrible pit of despair between those two times? Or did somebody actually coerce her? Well, what she had said when she said she's changed her mind was, I hope that people will not be disappointed in me. Mm -hmm. And I remember that stood out because I sat there and thought, what does that say yeah. about the message that she is getting? Mm -hmm. She sits there and thinks, I've chosen not to kill myself. I hope people aren't disappointed. Exactly. It just says a lot about... I don't think people are literally whispering into her ear, you know, kill yourself, Brittany, kill yourself, Brittany. But, you know, there's subtle coercion and pressure that she's oh, yeah. been feeling somewhere from someone. And I can only imagine that basically being the face of, you know, compassion and choices didn't help because she's built this entire campaign around, I want to die, I want to die. And then yeah. she gets to the point where she says, oh, well, I'm having second thoughts. Yeah. Well, now, you know, she's going to feel like I'm letting all these people down and God knows yeah. what the people around her were telling her. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if there was coercion involved and coercion takes on many different forms. Um, I remember something horrifying after she died, compassion and choices released a press release by their, this woman. I can't remember her name, which is the leader. Of, I'm going to just call them the hemlock society because compassion and choices is like saying pro choice to me. I just can't reconcile it in my brain. So the hemlock society released a press release saying that Brittany's death was the wind in their sails, the quote unquote wind in their sails for this justice movement of doctor assisted suicide in the United States. And you can't imagine, I'm, I'm positive that Brittany Maynard was receiving that rhetoric while she was alive. Like she was being told by this organization that she was gonna change the world. And my problem with this primarily is not the fact that Brittany went along with it. My problem with it is the fact that if you've ever studied psychology 101, there are certain things that don't constitute informed, that don't constitute consent. There are certain people who are not able to consent to um, moving forward on any given decision. Um, people who are mentally ill, which most sane people would classify suicidal persons as not mentally well. Um, yeah. Children, I mean, those are two groups that are explicitly targeted by the assisted suicide movement. And they're two groups of people that are, that are objectively unable to consent to their death. So you have to wonder that if this is a movement that's basically uh, built on coercion and an absence of consent. Yeah, and um, what is the, um, I can't remember their specific name right now, but the, the American organization dedicated to fighting suicide had basically come out recently. Not dead yet? <laughs> no, it's like the American suicide, I don't, it's, yeah. Okay, it's, it's, there is one called Not Dead Yet that works to counteract the assisted suicide and, and okay. euthanasia. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they basically had said that people, there's no difference between assisted suicide and suicide. They're seeking mm -hmm. them out for the same yeah. reason. And they shouldn't be treated separately. Um, because here's the thing, is that all of these studies, like in the British Medical Journal and, you know, the New England Journal of Medicine, what they found is that when you treat these underlying problems, such as the clinical depression, or give people support and resources, they withdraw their request for yeah. assisted suicide. And it's funny that you mentioned Not Dead Yet because I'm very familiar with them because mm -hmm. they work so hard to try to counteract this idea that is so prevalent in the world of how people with disabilities, it's, it's better dead than disabled. That's the idea that people have, better dead than disabled. Mm -hmm. and one of the perfect you know, examples of this that I, I just found so infuriating was the book and now movie, Me Before You. So I hate great. it so much. So many people, I mean, I don't know if anyone watching this saw that movie or read that. I don't know how anyone could have seen that and been convinced that assisted suicide was a good thing. I honestly don't. Well, because they don't see the person with disabilities as someone that's a real person. They're just a burden. You know, he, the whole point of that book and movie is that he is this person who is a quadriplegic. Now, let's, you know, remember something in this story that he is ridiculously wealthy Mm -hmm. He has a beautiful young woman who loves him. He's right. able to travel. 
Mm -hmm. And yet the idea is still it's better for him to die Mm -hmm. than to live his life as a disabled man. Right. That's literally, and, and and then the woman benefits from it to make it even more effective. Uh huh. With his money, mm-hmm. with his point to go live life boldly, and people with disabilities rightly were furious, saying, hey, "We already do live life boldly. Yeah, we do live our lives. Our lives are worth living." Yeah. And this whole idea, though, is presented because in the book he was able-bodied, got into a car accident, and then he's mm-hmm. quadriplegic. And so it's like this fate worse than death for him. It's the yeah. worst thing that can happen to someone to be disabled. And I don't want to pretend that going from being able-bodied to being a quadriplegic is not something that wouldn't be a traumatic experience and you know, horrible. Of course it would be. Yeah. But there's going to be that adjustment period. Right. But, you know, acting as if this is something that ruins your life and you're never going to have a fulfilling, bold happy mm-hmm. life again is an insult to every single person with disabilities that is living right now. And the whole point of this was, you know, that he goes and he kills himself through assisted mm-hmm. suicide and it's presented as a positive thing. And it's insanely offensive. And it further perpetuates this idea that people with disabilities are burdens. Right. People with disabilities are burdens. They are not full people. And we see the same thing when it comes to assisted suicide and abortion. Mm-hmm. You know, women that get a prenatal diagnosis, um, Dr. Brian Scott Coe, he's, he's pretty much the foremost researcher in the United States on Down syndrome. Mm-hmm. And he's done several studies about this, about the way women get a prenatal diagnosis. And they are often given inaccurate information. The diagnosis is delivered in a negative manner. Mm-hmm. And a large number of doctors, not a majority, thank God, but a large number admitted to even emphasizing the negative aspects Mm -hmm. in order to pressure the women to have an abortion. Yep. People see disabilities as burdens. They do not see a life with a disability as a life worth living. Right. And movies and books like Me Before You make it so much worse because the guy in the main character clearly was mentally ill. He was clearly suffering from clinical depression, if not worse. And there was no introduction into his life of psychological help. Um, The entire burden of his life or death was put on his shoulders. And it's like it never occurred to anybody to get him the help that he needed because he was clearly mentally ill and if you even if you get in an accident like that and your life physically really is suffering for the rest of your life obviously that would be extremely difficult um because he did get sick a lot and he did suffer physically but to be in a mental state where you think that death is better than life that is always a mental illness and he deserved the compassion to receive some kind of help with that. And just the fact that the movie didn't even address it. They didn't even, um, you know, introduce the idea of, of counseling and psychological help um, being, play, being a factor that was tried and didn't work or something like that. Like they just glorified, glorified suicide to such a degree that like you said, the, the girl ends up, getting an inheritance from him after he dies. So it's almost like it was better for everybody that he kills. Oh, him. Was. That's the whole point is that's better for everyone if he dies. So yeah. his whole feeling that I'm a burden, my life is a waste and it's mm-hmm. terrible is validated. Yeah, exactly. It's validated. And that's what assisted suicide does. Mm-hmm. It's like, instead of when you have the person who is suicidal, an able-bodied person, because God forbid if it's, if they've got a disability, let them shoot themselves. Right. Now, if you have an able-bodied person, that is suicidal. We move heaven and earth to try to prevent right. them from doing it. Right. But as soon as this person has a terminal illness yeah. or a disability, it's, oh, no, no, how can we help you die? Let's do it now. Do it quickly. You know, because if it's a disability, then, you know, we don't want to, right. obviously your life is terrible. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Your life's not dignified, so let's let you at least die with dignity, is what they like to say, right? Uh, with dignity, because suicide is dignified now. And the thing is, is it's it's never, you can look at just, I mean, there's so many examples, but it's, it's like you said, it's not a choice that's being freely made. And in a lot of cases, there is pressure put on these people to do so. And it's not even necessarily the person themselves. Like in Canada, not too long ago, um, within the last year, 
there was a mother of a girl, her daughter has disabilities and she's either a teenager or an adult, but in any mm-hmm. case, her mother has the ability to make medical decisions for her. Mm-hmm. Um, her daughter is not dying. She just had serious disabilities and she took her to the hospital to be treated for some just, you know, illness or whatever it was. And the doctor right outside the room where the girl could hear her starts asking her mother, Hey, you know, you'd qualify. She'd qualify for euthanasia if you want to have her euthanized. Mm. And of course her mother said, no, thank God. But yeah. she could have said yes. Yes. And there's people that would. And that that brings up another part of this whole coercion that I think we never talk about. And that's the fact that euthanasia is and assisted suicide involve a party that makes money off of the death, just like the abortion industry. And so what you have is a whole marketing platform and a rhetoric, um, a book of rhetoric for selling this form of death. So you have doctors that stand to make a profit off of administering euthanasia. You have organizations, I mean, in the Netherlands, these are very profitable organizations that literally you go on their website and they have a whole marketing system for how to sell a desperate person uh, assisted suicide. Uh, It's a profitable business and um, we have to consider the element of coercion that that um, is present just by virtue of the fact that one of the parties is making money when the person decides to go through with it. And then not to mention, and this is something we've seen already in Oregon and California, mm-hmm. in the United States, um, it's, more, it's much more expensive to treat someone's yeah. illness. Someone who has, say, cancer, mm-hmm. well, it's a lot more expensive to try to work to keep them alive. You can just mm-hmm hundred dollars and they're dead and boom no more money has to be spent and that's what's already happening is people that have um terminal ill will not but are fighting cancer and so on Mm -hmm. their insurance companies are denying yeah treatment or their treatment and instead say hey we'll pay for your assisted suicide Mm -hmm. though Mm-hmm. Not the patient asking for it first this has happened on multiple occasions yeah that's coercive in both Oregon and California. Mm-hmm. Like, this is already happening. In the yeah, United, happening. I've seen those stories. And that is textbook coercion. That's textbook coercion. Um, can you imagine, I'm trying to think of a parallel that would like draw this out for, for in a different situation. Like say an employer um, went to a woman and said, um, we're, we don't cover, we're, we don't wanna cover your maternity care but um, we'll, we'll pay for the abortion pill. <laughs> like it's the same, I, the same concept. Um, in the wake of the Me Too movement, like that would not go over well, but we have to ask like, why are we accepting it in our own country? Because I mean, it, it, all of it goes back to the same idea and that's ableism. Mm-hmm. And that's why, you know, we talked about at the beginning, these experiences we have in schools and, and such, because it further perpetuates this idea that people with disabilities are not welcome. They are not wanted. They are a burden. Mm -hmm. And that mentality is what leads to these problems with assisted suicide and abortion of people who have disabilities and or terminal illnesses. Because when we have that mentality, that's where this leads to. Um, So it's like, yes, making these things illegal, that's, that's good, but we have to also, it's, it's both and, mm-hmm. not either or. You know, we have to work on a truly inclusive society because, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it just, without doing that, then it's just going to continue. It's going to continue. Yeah. This idea that people with disabilities are better off dead. And you can see it in, you know, I mean, how many times have we seen news reports of so and so, you know, mother throws her child off a bridge and everyone's all, oh, it's so horrible, it's so terrible. And then, oh, by the way, the kid was autistic. And then all of a sudden, it's, well, she shouldn't have done it, but, right. you know, she shouldn't have done it, but, you know, well, man, it's so hard being a special needs parent and having to raise a child like that. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we justify it anymore. You know, all of a sudden, all the comment section changes and, you know, oh, well, she just needs like a slap on the wrist. She shouldn't have done it. But, you know, who can blame her? Is yeah. that people have? We have a lot of work to do to change the, the culture. Um, 
I think I, I've been thinking through this whole conversation. Like, I I, I always want to like, okay, let's get started. Let's let's do something. <laughs> and I can't think of any anything that we can do except be talking about it. You know, I mean, that's the first step is just to like have this conversation and get people involved in the conversation, raising awareness that it's happening. Um, obviously, so I hope that people will continue this conversation. <laughs> Well, and I mean, this is another thing where our schools can come into play so much mm. because the older generations, I almost don't want to blame them too much because they were raised in a different way than we were. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 50, 60 years ago, people with Down syndrome and other disabilities, they were institutionalized. Right. And even when I was going to school, like, I got the prenatal diagnosis with Wyatt, and it was terrifying in part because yeah. it's like I had no idea what Down syndrome. I mean, I knew it was, but you know, like I never knew anyone with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. I didn't have people with Down syndrome in my classes. You know, right. you never encounter these people, and when you do, it's it's you're only seeing it in kind of a negative light. You know, that's not an excuse, but it's like okay, well, it's kind of understandable. Mm -hmm. Whereas the school that Wyatt goes to now, you know, it's very diverse mm -hmm. um, in the sense that there are kids of lots of different races and lots of different abilities, mm -hmm. both of these things. And it makes my heart feel so full every time I go to drop him off because I see all of these kids with all of these different abilities and all of these different skin colors and they're all there together in the cafeteria mm -hmm. and they're happy to be with each other. Yeah. You know, there were these, um, I was walking wide in one day and this, this family and they were, they were an African American family and they were behind me and the daughters, I'd never seen them before. They were much older than Wyatt, like eight or nine or so. Um, and we're walking in and they go, daddy, daddy, that's Wyatt. That's Wyatt. And Aww. I was just, I almost started crying. So I'm just like, Aww. they were so happy to see him. Yeah. And I just wanted to hug them because it's like, this is exactly what we do to change these things. Yeah, that's this true. Happy white racism. This mm -hmm. is how we fight ableism. Mm -hmm. If we change our schools, it may not make a big difference for our generation, but mm -hmm. it will for future generations. Yeah. So if we have more inclusive schools where you have lots of people with lots of different abilities, mm -hmm. whether it's a kid in a wheelchair or a kid with Down syndrome or a kid who's mm -hmm. autistic, right. these kids will be exposed. I don't want to say exposed. Yeah. That's not bad. <laughs> That's true. But, you know, <laughs> You know, they'll they'll be around people with disabilities. It won't be something scary. Yeah, see, exactly. Hey, another person just like me that's just yes. a little bit different. Right. And yeah. you know, hopefully that will lead to a better understanding and better acceptance as they get older. Mm -hmm. I think that makes a huge difference. Yeah, we are actually about to switch to public school from Catholic private school um, in part because the Catholic school is just a little bit more homogenous than the public school. And, you know, I'm not, that's not the only reason. And that, that wouldn't be a reason in and of itself, because I feel like I could always expose my kids or have my kids be around many different types of people outside of school. But that, that is one of the factors that's leading us to, to go to the public school at this point. And I'm kind of excited because, um, uh, it, it's it's been kind of a challenge to go to a school that tends to have a certain type of person that only goes there and there's not much diversity. So, yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to that. And it, it just, I really do think it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. you know, when you're, I mean, we see our schools in general are so much more racially diverse now, mm -hmm. um, which is great. The disabilities, that's still kind of the area where it's, you know, lacking. Mm -hmm. And racism is a big buzzword. There's, you know, lots of talk and, and fight about, you know, how to combat racism and sexism, too. But ableism is the ism that no one cares about. Yeah, that's no true. About ableism. No one cares if you really discriminate mm -hmm. with disabilities. And, you know, that's, it's pervasive. And, we can't just wait to change it until it's something that affects us. And I say this, and I'm, I'm kind of hypocritical here because this was not a fight I took on until I had a child with a disability mm -hmm. myself, which is not something I'm proud of. But that's also why I talk about it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think it's admirable. It's it's great. So, 
that's, you know, maybe, it, you know, go to the principal of your school and, and ask them, you know, hey, what can we do to help other kids that, you know, maybe have learning disabilities or how can we, you know, bring them there? I know that there are schools, like there's one in Arizona, um, School Choice helps a lot. There's a Catholic school in Arizona. I spoke to the principal there mm -hmm. and basically they use the funding for children with disabilities um, essentially in a different manner so that they're able to have aids with them and so on and so forth. So that way awesome. they're able to go and be fully inclusive. So there's ways for it to happen. It is possible. We just have to be willing to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. I feel like this was really helpful in kind of giving us a launching pad for where to go from here. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good place to leave off, actually, unless you have more you want to add. No, I'm good. I've, I've learned a lot today. <laughs> Well, thank you for tuning in. Um, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Fidelis Women. Um, that's it for us this week. Make sure to tune in next week for Cassie and Lauren. We will talk to you soon. Bye, everyone.